Welcome back, D2 sports fans. It's another episode, the 10th ever episode of the D2 Nation podcast. I am your co-host, Wayne Cavati, and joining me as always is the great Bethany Bowman. How are you, Bethany? Doing good. Glad to be back for another episode of the D2 Nation with you, Wayne, and our special guest. So this week, we're mixing it up a little bit. We're stepping away from the current D2 landscape to talk to one of the more notable recent D2 alums. Joining us today is Washington Nationals starting pitcher and Lemoyne Dolphin, Josiah Gray. Welcome to the D2 Nation, Josiah. Hey, y'all. Thank you for having me. Uh, you know, glad to talk about my D2 roots and uh, talk more about my story. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's what we're really excited about. We're going to grill you on is the is, are your D2 roots on the D2 Nation podcast, obviously. Um, for those unfamiliar with your story, when I started watching you, you know, I've been on the D2 beat for a long time. You are a shortstop, right? You are a shortstop and a reliever. So before we get into your transformation and where you are today, let's go back to the recruiting process. Were there a lot of offers and what made you choose LeMoyne? Yeah, so honestly, LeMoyne was my only offer. I had interest from other schools around the area, not too many other schools, but I had a little bit of interest, but LeMoyne was the only school that gave me a formal offer. Um, so after, you know, a summer of playing some baseball and not really getting much attention, you know, I was like, yeah, I want to go to LeMoyne. So I went up for a fishing visit and, you know, fell in love with the campus. Obviously, Syracuse um, is about four hours from where I'm from. And, and we drove up here today, loved the campus and everything like that. And, you know, it was kind of just a match made in heaven, uh, so to say. I, I'm a Syracuse basketball fan. And before you, the only reason I knew LeMoyne was because they beat them, beat Syracuse in an exhibition game. And that's how I knew where LeMoyne was. Yeah. <laughs> really big, really big on the campus. Yeah. Then you're at LeMoyne. You're doing all right at shortstop. You see a little pop added from your freshman to sophomore year, but on the mound, you improved dramatically, posting a 0.63 ERA and whip while striking out about 14 per nine in your second season. Did you think with those mechanics and pitch selection, um, you know, you're starting to realize, hey, I may have a future as a pitcher here? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, just over time, it sort of just came to me. Obviously, you know, I started getting in the weight room and started learning from a lot of the guys, uh, Coach Cassidy. At LeMoyne and you know things just sort of um, took a turn for me going from you know wanting to be that shortstop to being you know a closer and the guy that you know had a future on the mound so the way it all happened was sort of natural but obviously you know you hear about the D2 kid that you know makes the full transition and everyone's like man that's that's crazy it's a story to be heard um, but yeah you know it was sort of just a natural transition and I went from, you know, backing up uh, third base my freshman year, being a reliever to, you know, being a closer, and then my junior year being, you know, starting and getting drafted. So, yeah, everything was uh, crazy. You know, I still can't wrap my head around it sometimes, but, you know, mm -hmm. that's that's my story, and uh, that's what I have to say about it. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's cool for me. You're the first, since I started covering, the first guy I got to watch from college make it to make your debut, and you know, I've messaged you a hundred times this season. I'm proud I am of you and how exciting it is and everything. But before we get to the big leagues, let's go to the Cape because you had the big summer in Cape Cod. And I remember going into the 2018 season, I talked to Coach Cassidy and he said, he sat you down and said, look, your infield days are over. <laughs> and that was it. So you basically went from, you know, a D2 baseball player to a draft prospect in a month and a half of the summer. We'll talk about that summer a little bit, what you were working on, and when you started realizing, holy cow, this is kind of a big deal. Uh, honestly, um, you know, my first outing out there to my last one, you know, there were, you go to the Cape Cod League, there's going to be 20 plus stuff there, no matter which game, you know, they're there to see everyone just to, you know, make sure they saw everyone, put them in the database and whatnot. <laughs> uh, but yeah, going out there, you know, I was lucky to be one of the handful of these guys out there, but also be there on a the full contract. So, you know, I, that gave me some time to, you know, just adjust to the competition out there because going from the visit to the kid coming, you know, not even dead. So I'm grateful that I had that full contract there in Chatham because, you know, I had two outings along my summer there that, you know, weren't too great. And, you know, if I'm on a temporary contract, I'm probably getting released. Um, but, you know, I had the full contract, so I got to work and I got to just, 
you know, to see how hitters were reading my pitches and, and just set up hitters better and just attack hitters. And, you know, from that, from those outings on, you know, I just went out there with the mentality that, you know, I might be the guy from Lemoyne College. They don't know who I am, but I'm going to go out there and impact these guys. And just learning that has stuck with me till this day. Uh, but I would say that's really where, you know, I got that sort of uh, fortification or that, uh, I guess, experience, you know, playing against guys that are, you know, maybe a level ahead of me on paper, uh, that I can compete with them and you know, get them out. And uh, that's stuck with me to play today. And then, boom, it's 2018. You were pitching as a full-time starter, and it was pretty amazing. You go 11-0 with a 1.25 ERA and strike out just over 10 batters per nine. Scouts' eyes were on you pretty much every start, and then you get drafted in the second round. What was that season like for you? And tell us a little bit about draft day memories. Yeah, that season was a lot of fun. You know, it was my goal to go out there every time and, you know, give the team a quality start and just want to win ball games because that year we had a great team. You know, I think we won 35 plus games. We appeared in the NCAA tournament for the first time since 2012. So I just wanted to go out there and give the team quality starts. Obviously, you know, everyone was aware of the scouts and, you know, the magnitude of, you know, myself possibly being drafted a few months later. But I didn't try to get that, get too caught up on that because, you know, I wanted my job to just go out there and win. And that's what I knew in pitching, obviously, in my career in pitching being so short. That's what I wanted to do. And I knew with going out there and having quality starts, the team would, you know, eventually win games and scouts would love to see that. So uh, that was a lot of fun. And then transitioning into draft night, obviously, that was a great night, you know, a night I'll never forget. Just, you know, hanging around and not really knowing who I was, who was going to take me, but knowing that a lot of teams were interested and getting that call the first night obviously is it's so surreal seeing Adam Dunn, you know, great pro uh, say my name that night and, you know, just being able to enjoy the moment and, and sort of just be like, man, we, we, we did it. You know, we, uh, we made the impossible, you know, seem possible. And uh, that's a lot of, you know, I have a lot of memories from that year and draft night and stuff like that, but um, you know, it's always fun to recall it and, and think about it and, you know, share my perspective on it because, uh, people don't get to hear those perspectives sometimes. I love that you say we made it and, you know, we did it. I love that part of it. Um, <laughs> let now, so now we're a pro. Let's talk a little bit about your pro career. It's been quite the start, you know, two <laughs> memorable big trades that you're a part of. You made, you cracked the top 100 prospects. And then this year you get the call and you get to make your debut against the best team in baseball <laughs> at the time. <laughs> It's crazy, right? Yeah. I remember. I remember. I shot you a message that night, actually, and I said, "Are you nervous? Are you are you a little scared? Are you excited?" And I think you just said yes. I think that's what I said. Uh, what was that moment like from the the minute you found out you were getting the call to striking out that first batter? Oh man, um, getting that call. You know, it was a random Sunday. I was in Oklahoma City. I had uh, worked my way back from a injury previously in the in the uh, season. Um, but, you know, I was about two or three outings in and obviously there were rumblings going on because I knew the Dodgers needed a starter um, with Kershaw going down, I think a week prior. And I was like, OK, like I do line up, but, you know, they can do a bullpen game. They can move some things around to, you know, just with the guys they actively have, because obviously I wasn't on the 40 man roster. Um, so they would have to take someone off and, and things like that. But. Yeah, you know, it was a regular Sunday and, you know, I get a random call through WhatsApp, the uh, messaging app. And I'm like, I'm not taking this because I don't recognize the phone number. And then they call back and then I'm like, oh, I got to take this. And it was Travis Barbary, the Oklahoma City manager, just basically saying, hey, um, I got a message here. You have a flight later today to L.A. Um, you're potentially going to pitch Tuesday. And I was like, man. It's crazy. It was really short and sweet. Uh, but then, you know, just sharing that moment, my girlfriend was with me. My, uh, I called my mom. I called my agent. I called um, friends, um, other family. And, you know, just enjoying that moment. And then just packing up everything was really hectic. I had a few hours to go to Oklahoma City, got to L.A., finally had a nice dinner. Um, and then the next day, you know, I just did my stuff. And um, that Tuesday I made my major league debut. And then getting that first strikeout and, 
you know, just reminiscing after the first outing was a lot of fun just because of how quick it happened, but also, you know, that's something you dream of as a kid. That's something you want. You think you know how it's going to play out, but you never do until, you know, you're there and you're throwing that first pitch. And, um, you know, that's a moment that I'll truly never forget. I'll never forget, you know, my first strikeout being uh, Wilmer Flores or, you know, my first out actually being Alex Wood, a guy I was traded for. Um, oh, yeah. at one moment. So yeah, yeah. The little things like that, I'm never going to forget. And, um, you know, the debut was really fun with the Dodgers, especially in that big of a series against the giants as well. You know, I, I went out there and, you know, somewhat held them down. <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it was a lot of fun and, uh, you know, I'm grateful to, to be in that position, um, to make my debut this year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and this kind of goes back to the, when you were saying we made it, but one thing I think is pretty cool is when I watch you pitch every time, it's always from Lemoyne, right? And you're you're really a select bunch of Dolphins. I think there's, you know, your, your former coach, Coach Cassidy, is one of them. I think it's five or six, you know. So you're, you're not just another Vandy boy, right? You're not yeah. just another <laughs> SEC baseball player. Do you ever think about that when you hear from Lemoyne, like you're, you're almost an ambassador and, <laughs> and, and you like carry that load? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Honestly, uh, you put it in a really good way. It's like, you know, I'm out there, obviously, um, you know, repping the, the school, you know, with a lot of pride. And, you know, when people hear, you know, he came from Lemoyne College, you know, I'm sure the first question they have to themselves is, what's Lemoyne College? Where is it at? Things like that. So I'm sure, you know, the the uh, brand and the name, you know, just sort of has stuck with me. And, you know, that's something that comes with the territory, comes with the um, sort of shoes that I'm in. But, you know, myself, uh, Ryan Murphy, who's with the Giants organization, who had a great year, you know, we're guys that, you know, were underlooked, under, unfortunately, in the Northeast area. You know, we went to Lemoyne, sort of got some polish on our on our stuff and here we are now you know thriving in our respective lanes um so you know it's been great it's been great to you know go out there and say you know i don't i never went to division one school i never um, got that opportunity you know i got one offer and here i am now you know kind of just instilling that uh point that you know you work hard and and you know things line up for you you know you can be here you can be where you can be fulfilling your dreams and things like that any D2 student athletes out there, what would be your advice to them? Yeah, yeah just like I said, you know, there's going to be only so many opportunities, especially in D2 baseball in the Northeast, but just in D2 baseball in general. So, you know, just making sure that you're taking every opportunity and running with it. You know, I got the chance to play in the Hamptons League my freshman year, you know, a lower level summer league, but, you know, being a guy that wanted to go out there and sort of just make a name for myself and, and figure out, you know, where my future was in the game of baseball. You know, I went out there and basically transformed my career, you know, went out there, threw the ball well, hit okay, but threw the ball better, basically. And and then just fed off of that for years and years to come. And, you know, Lemoyne had great relationships with scouts. So, you know, my sophomore year fall, you know, there were plenty of scouts, you know, checking in saying, hey, How's this great kid look? And then, you know, the junior year um, sort of just took care of itself. But yeah, going out there and just embracing every opportunity because, you know, there's not going to be all, a lot of times when there's going to be scouts or games or, you know, opportunities to get to that next level just because of it being Division two. You know, D1 is going to get all the praise just because the talent pool is is greater. So, yeah, like I said, just embracing every opportunity, you know, if there's a scout at a game here and there, you know, going out there and playing your best game that you can and, you know, hoping they take a liking to you. And when you look back upon it all, what made D2 so special for you? I'm also a D2 alum, so, you know, I have a lot of things that come to mind for me, so I want to hear yours. Yeah, honestly, just... Lemoyne, you know, was no bigger than my high school, 3,500 kids, 4,000 kids. Um, and, you know, just the em embracing the community up there um, has been great. You know, I still keep in contact with a bunch of people that, um, you know, were, were older than me, were younger than me, same year, things like that. And I don't know if I would have got that experience at a bigger school, obviously, you know, to some extent, but 
you know, there are days where I hear from um, distinguished alumni, you know, um, Jim Deshays, hopefully I'm not butchering his last name. Um, he reached out to me through Twitter after I debuted, um, you know, just seeing guys that might have some Lemoyne ties or they may know of Lemoyne um, just in passing, you know, hearing from them and saying, hey, like, that's awesome, man. Congrats to you. Like those sorts of things. I don't think that would be as special, you know, if I went to a Vanderbilt or a University of Texas, obviously, you know, there's fraternity no matter where you go, but I think it's just a little bit more special just knowing that, you know, I came from one college division two school where, you know, baseball isn't the sport. And, you know, here I am, you know, to tell the tale and then tell my story. I love it. I love to hear that. Um, all right, Josiah, here's the thing. Just because you're a D2 alum and a big league pitcher does not mean you get to avoid the D2 nation hot seat. So are you ready for the hard part of the show? This all, is right, the hard part. all right, let's do it. All right, let's get started. Okay, so first off easy, one thing that also stands out is that you were an academic All-American as well. So if you weren't playing <laughs> baseball, what would you be doing? Uh, honestly, um, uh, I have such a passion for the game, so it'd be working in baseball, uh, preferably in like player development, baseball ops. Uh, but being around the game, you know, just seeing the next and up and coming Josiah Gray um, and kind of just working with him and, and, and making things go. But that was always my plan, basically after Lemoyne. And then basically I started growing harder. <laughs> and then, um, you know, my career changed from being behind the scenes to basically being the scene. So um, pretty, pretty funny just the way things have worked. But yeah, that was always my uh, for, you know, I got good at baseball. <laughs> I got good at baseball. That's funny the way you put that. <laughs> As a Yankees fan, if I remember this correctly, uh, and this is many years ago when I did the first interview with you, but you were a big Jeter and A-Rod fan growing up, right? Mm -hmm. So once once you became that pitcher, is there someone, a big leaguer that you became a fan of and tried to emulate in your work? Yeah, throughout my like scouting interviews and things like that, I've always talked about how much, you know, I've looked up to Marcus Stroman, uh, CeCe Sabathia, guys like that, Luis Severino, um, just because, of, you know, the way they went out there and competed, um, obviously, you know, plus plus stuff, but then it's the way they are off the field and the way, you know, their teammates talk about them, you know, that's stuff that has stuck with me about those guys and sort of how I've wanted to emulate my career. Uh, you know, Stroman goes out there uh, competing, you know, you know what you're going to get day in, day, day out. And, you know, he's done it for uh, eight or so years now, and that's, a testament to him and and he goes in and he works for it you know he's an undersized guy and he's new york guy as well you know he's worked for it and he's going to continue to work for it and you know he's going to go out to be there to be one of the best and then cc on the other hand obviously a uh, future hall of famer <clears throat> and then growing up in new york you know it's hard to not want to root for cc sabathia because of you know him being the dude in his prime years and then you know, sustaining that throughout the end of his career, you know, with a little bit um, lesser stuff, but, you know, the same heart, the same grit, you know, that's what's stuck with me um, with him and with a ton of guys that I looked up to just because of how they go out there. They compete every fifth day, you know, your chances of winning are pretty damn high um, and they're going to, you know, you know what you're going to get. So that's kind of the way I've looked at those guys and the way I want to emulate, emulate those guys is, you know, go out there and fit they and give the team a good chance to win a ball game because at the big league level, that's all that matters. Is there a social media platform that you're addicted to and do you have any account or personality that you really like following? Uh, I would say Twitter. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Uh, most of the time just reading like hopefully good stuff, like investment advice, stuff like that. Uh, but you know, they're the accounts like Cespedes Barbecue, Foolish Baseball, you know, the sort of parody baseball accounts, uh, Jared, Jared Carabas even, um, you know, those guys, I get a kick out of watching those guys and, and seeing their tweets because uh, most of the time it's, you know, it's about baseball, which I love, but it's, you know, with a good tone, like a funny tone. And it's like, man, like, you know, the Twitter, Twitter just um, becomes a lot more enjoyable with accounts like that. So those are the three I'd, I'd probably put out there. Yeah. As a Yankee fan, when 
Carabas does the <laughs> home run by Aaron Judge, and it's like yeah, <laughs> yeah, those are yeah, those. <laughs> when he started doing that, I I was like, you get suckered in because you're like, maybe he's telling the truth because there are some times where he tweets out good Yankee stuff. Yeah, and I'm like, oh man, I'm suckered in again. It's just <laughs> yeah. the opposite. <laughs> every time, every time. Um, so you've only made, you know, small sample size. You only made 12 or 13 starts this year, but you've seen some lineups twice and some pretty good ones at that. Are there any that come to mind? Like who's like the toughest out you you had and you wish you would never have to face again? <laughs> oh, man. Um, you know, yeah, like you said, I've gone through a few teams twice um, this year. Honestly, the toughest out so far has been either Freddie Freeman or Bryce Harper, you know, um, former MVPs, future MVPs, um, if not the MVP this year, you know, with Bryce Harper, um, seeing how that uh, plays out. But yeah, those guys are really, really tough outs. You know, you go in with a good scouting report and you get on there on the mound and you're like, man, I feel like he's covering everything and they are covering everything. (laughs) And it just get it just makes your life a little tougher and you just have to think about setting them up a little bit better. But yeah, those guys are no slouches. Um, you know, they're paid what they're paid because of that. They're, you know, going to have um, Hall of Fame careers because of, you know, just not being easy outs. And, you know, they provide thump in those lineups and they keep you honest on days that you got to face them. So as a prospect, you've moved around quite a bit. So what coast do you prefer, east or west? <laughs> oh, man, that's a really tough question. Uh, I would say east coast, uh, you know, family and friends get to come to a lot more games. You know, at, at every game um, on the weekends this past year in D.C., uh, I had various amounts of family and friends there. Um, in L.A., you know, obviously I only got to start twice. Uh, but my for my first start, you know, family, friends, such were there. But, you know, for the second start, you know, I had only only had a friend or two there. And uh, I think that support after games or for games, you know, is, is important because, you know, until this year, uh, my family wasn't able to see me play professionally because I was on the West Coast or, you know, in Oklahoma or, or anywhere. So, you know, seeing that, um, obviously, you know, appreciate you. It, you appreciate it because you're at the top of the top, but then, you know, like they're there to still, you know, root you on no matter good or bad. So I would say East coast just for, you know, that like family aspect and, and getting to see friends after games that I haven't seen, you know, since, you know, the off season and things like that. And Washington's not that far from New York. So you even, you're even close to home to go see them when you want to. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so let's talk, obviously, when you when you came out, you know, everyone knew about the fastball, right? Talk us a little bit, let's nerd out here. Talk a little <laughs> bit about your, the evolution of your pitches. And mm-hmm. if you're in an 0-2 count and you're not allowed to throw the fastball, what do you bring in? Yeah, honestly, uh, either the slider or the curveball. Um, to the lefty, more times than not, it'll be the slider over, or it'll be the curveball over the slider. To the righty, it could be either or, just kind of seeing their swing path and um, the pitch charts and their mismatch and things like that. But yeah, those pitches have been huge for me um, over the last three years, you know, coming from Lemoyne, you know, I only had a slider and it was okay. I have, I've tinkered with the grip a little bit just to throw it harder and softer at times and, you know, just making sure the command's in the right spot. But then in 2019, about halfway through the year, you know, developing a curveball, developing something, you know, with a little bit of top spin and that can offer um, basically a different look, you know, as opposed to the slider and the fastball. And, you know, that pitch was huge for me as well this year. You know, both of those pitches having over 40 percent um, swing and miss rate. So it's um, uncommon, you know, to have two pitches with that sort of those sort of numbers. Um, and they've taken me this far and they're going to take me for years and years to come obviously with continuing to refine command and movement and velocity and things like that. But, you know, I definitely wouldn't be here today without both of those pitches, you know, becoming solid and plus offerings for me. Okay. Then this might be a tough one because one of your former teams is still involved at your last question, world series prediction. Oh man. Um, 
I think obviously tomorrow's game is really, really contingent on who wins because I think if the Giants win, I think they win it all. Um, I think they beat the Braves in the NLCS, then they beat whoever in the ALCS. But on the other hand, if the Dodgers win, I see the Dodgers beating the Braves and then, you know, having some trouble with Houston or um, who's, who's Houston? Boston. Playing? Houston to Boston. I see there being a little trouble just because, you know, the L.A. Boston, that's always a good series. And then Houston is Houston. And, you know, there's a lot of bad blood there. So to sum that all up, I got. Oh, man, I got L.A. coming out on top. Uh, I'm going to root for some of my friends over there and hopefully they pull it out tomorrow and, you know, run through the Braves and, and beat up Houston or Boston. Hey, I'll, I'll add in that. Uh... Blake Trinan for the Dodgers. He's from about 30, 40 minutes from where I grew up. Yeah, I, I love Blake. I think man. I'm for the Dodgers too. <laughs> yeah, I love Blake, man. He's a, he's a really good guy. And actually the day after or that night of, you know, the trade, we were just hopping off the plane. We landed in Arizona and he sort of um, told me about the way he was traded the first time from Washington to Oakland and sort of just um, – in familiar shoes and he was like man just go embrace it and you know I haven't kept in touch with them at all uh, but the next time I see him I'll, I'm sure we'll have a great conversation and a lot of people have nothing but good things to say about him well congratulations you survived the hot seat <laughs> thank, thank you, you. <laughs> thank you so much once again for joining us uh enjoy I'm sure just the little time you have off before everything <laughs> ramps up again uh, absolutely but, uh, I know we can't wait to see you back in action. And speaking of action, D2 Nation, don't forget, you can get all D2 action on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, and just about anywhere else you want to listen. Give us a follow, and we'll see you next week on the D2 Nation.